Hey everybody, this podcast was pre-recorded before we had to have the delay in the podcast. And so you'll hear the date October 2nd as your deadline for season four feedback. That is incorrect. You have until October 24th, 2018 to submit any season four feedback. Thank you very much. This podcast is now available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more. Please leave a written review on whatever app you get this podcast from. Spoiler alert, when this podcast talks about Game of Thrones on HBO, it talks in the context of the most recently aired episode. And when it talks A Song of Ice and Fire books, it talks in the context of the most recently released book by George R. R. Martin. You've been warned. Dedicated to HBO's Game of Thrones and George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire book series, you're listening to Matt's audio blog. Game of Thrones. And now, here's your host, Matt Murdock. And welcome back once again to Matt's audio blog, Game of Thrones style. We look at the story and the music of HBO's Game of Thrones, and we look at the story of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series. My name is Matt. Thanks for joining me. And welcome to another Thursday edition of the podcast. Sorry, no guests for this particular episode, but Bubba and Kelly, who are in our season four, episode one episode, will be returning for the next one, season four, episode four. On Thursdays, we do the music first, but first I want to tell you a little bit about the podcast itself. Matt's audio blog dot com m a t t s audioblog dot com it's your one stop shop for all things this podcast contact links our YouTube link if you prefer to get this podcast in that form you can also find all kinds of other information you can find all of the back episodes of the podcast you can find links to some of the other podcasts that I've done in the past as well there's a whole catalog of stuff out there that I started and never finished. I promise you, we are going to finish this particular podcast, at least up through season eight of Game of Thrones, and hopefully into the next two books by George R. R. Martin, assuming they ever get here. At any rate, if you have any feedback regarding season four that we're reviewing now or anything about the podcast in general, you want to get it off your chest, you can send an email to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. That's M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com. Or you can tweet to Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter, M-A-T-T-S G-O-T blog on the Twitter. And if you get everything into me by October 2nd, 2018, then you will, of course, be included in our next feedback podcast. I do one at the end of each season, and I would love to hear your thoughts about this season or any of the prior seasons, or if there's something that I said in the podcast that you disagreed with, which may very well be the case in this particular podcast, as you will soon see. Uh, But feel free to contact me in the ways that I just mentioned, and if you do so by October 2nd, 2018, you will be included in the next feedback podcast. Also, There are podcast app links at the website as well. And you could really do me a solid by leaving a written review on whatever podcast app that you're using, as long as it allows it. I do understand that some podcast apps just simply don't have that feature. But for the ones that do, they typically help get you stronger in the search engines based on the number of written reviews that you have That in a combination of some kind of crazy formula of downloads and looks and all this other stuff. But the thing that always helped me with Podcast Winterfell was, of course, written reviews. And that's why Podcast Winterfell continues to stay, I think, like in the top 30 Game of Thrones podcasts. And there are three billion out there. The difference is, is that mine doesn't even usually make the search engine the bottom of the search engine. And I need your help to get there. So uh, iTunes or Stitcher or whatever other app might allow you to leave a written review. Thank you very much in advance for leaving that review. And it doesn't have to be positive. Naturally, if there's something about this podcast that you just can't stand, feel free to share that with potential listeners as well. And I will certainly uh, relay that kind of feedback. Well, any review feedback in the next feedback podcast as well. I don't know if I mentioned, but today we're looking at Season 4, Episode 3, Breaker of Chains, written by the showrunners Benny Offenweiss and directed by Alex Graves. On Thursdays, 
we do the music first, and today we're not really looking at anything that's strongly thematic, but is very powerful musically. An analysis of the music in HBO's Game of Thrones. You did this! You did this! We have to leave. Take him! Take him! That clip from the very beginning of the episode, and it's kind of an exciting piece, right? It's from when Sansa and Dantos are fleeing King's Landing, and it's kind of a perfect example of what subject we're going to be talking about today. We're talking about incidental music, and what is incidental music? It's music that's crafted for a single moment on film, and it's never really repeated in the same way that, say, a music theme is like the Stark theme, the Reigns of Castamere, those are themes that are repeated throughout the series and they represent specific families or specific kind of feelings or what have you. In this particular episode, there is some thematic material scattered here or there, but there is actually much more incidental music than normal in this particular episode of Game of Thrones. In fact, this may be the most single-run original music that Ramin ever had to do for a single episode, although I can't statistically prove that. It just felt that way. But let's start by talking about this piece that was accompanying Sansa's escape. Again, a piece of incidental music, and it has several elements that are tailored to help us feel scared for Sansa. Will she escape? Should she escape? And one way that composers generate that kind of excitement that we're feeling in this particular scene is to use fast little moving phrases that don't really jump around in terms of jumping huge jumps between notes. And they typically cycle repeatedly. And that's what helps to build up the tension. I I'm talking specifically in this one about this little figure here. The fact that this little figure is buzzing around like that, it helps increase the tension without really tipping what direction the story may take. Also, it having small distances between the individual notes helped to create what we call an illusion of dissonance. And what I mean by that is our ears tell us we're hearing what I just played on the piano. But sometimes, somewhere down in the brain, it all gets blurred together. So our emotional feeling seems to generate more of this kind of sound in our head rather than what is actually played. And again, it's created purely psychologically in our own minds, but it helps to sell the danger for Sansa. When you have notes like that gritting together, it's like, what's going to happen? And there's another type of harmonic dissonance that happens in this particular piece of incidental music, and that's the big harmonic chords, which seem to both simultaneously be part of the key and yet not part of the key. We call those borrowed chords and let's see if you can identify what the borrowed chords are in this particular phrase. Okay, so while the final chord definitely resolves to minor, and of course minor makes things seem scary in this particular case, it's the other two chords that actually create the tension against the lowest note, the bass note. And Ramin doesn't just do that once. In the next phrasing, he changes the second chord to sound even more out of place, like this. Mm -hmm. 
and in a very similar way to the moving line kind of blurring together on our head, this second chord creates a second dissonance that it actually is almost identical to the moving line, just in a different place. This time, the dissonance comes in straight correlation to the home key of the piece. So you get this sound. It's really ugly, right? And that ugliness translates in our mind to something being abnormal. And of course, there's nothing more abnormal than danger, right? We all want to be safe, so it's abnormal for us to feel danger. But the cue itself then shifts gears once more once Sansa's out on the water. Remember, it's foggy, it's mysterious. Where is Dantos taking her? And so we get some really low dissonances in this next clip like this. The proximity of lower pitch or higher pitch can elevate or cloud the tension. The tension is still there, but in this case, we wouldn't know exactly what to expect. It's so foggy, we can't see anything. We can't even see where they're going, right? And so it creates an air of mystery. And when you have lower dissonances like that, it makes things muddy. And the muddiness doesn't necessarily be as pronounced as, say, in the first clip that we heard. Um, we just get the mystery. So see if that makes you feel this way as we listen to Sansa and Dantos going across the water. that feels really weird right that not not so much heightening danger but it just feels weird and then of course little finger pulls her in and they have their little talk and the whole necklace plan is slowly revealed and as little finger is talking there is a slow version of the chaos is a ladder theme but Obviously, we can all already recognize that theme when we hear it. And we're talking about incidental music today, not thematic. So let's move on. And we're going to jump from the beginning of the episode to the end and cover the music that accompanied Danny's approach to Marine. Now, there is only one common element between the approach itself, the incidental music, and anything that is actually even associated with Danny. That commonality is the meter of the piece. A meter is how many counts are in each measure or musical phrase, and it's dictated in this particular part by the drums. And in this case, the mixed meter is of five counts, similar to the unsullied, or sometimes we call it the Dracarys theme that we heard in season three, episode four. Here's the pulse in the piece that's coming up to listen for. So that gives us a rhythm of five counts, and then the, the phrase repeats, right? And that is similar to the Dracarys or Unsullied theme. However, that's the only thing that's similar about this music. Everything else is completely new in terms of the chords or any kind of sense of melody, even though there isn't a whole lot of melody in there. But let's listen to the clip.
So, a new music. Maybe you could call this uh, Danny's first impression of Marine. But either way, it doesn't ever really repeat itself in the same way as we hear it here. And then, once the Marine champion comes out to challenge Danny's challenger or whatever, a different kind of tone starts to happen, like in this clip. A single rider. The champion of Marine. So just like in the scene with Sansa where we had those big chords and they created a, an illusion of dissonance, here we have the higher sounds in this part of the piece that are creating the dissonance against the bass note. And once again, this creates tension. Who is this Marine champion? Is he an actual threat to Danny? Or is he a threat to whoever Danny puts up against him? Now, while I don't need to go through those chords again, just so you know, it functions the same way as we first heard in the Sansa piece. So let's move on to the middle of the episode. We've covered either end. Let's jump back to the middle. And we're going to go to where Tyrion realizes that he must convince Podrick to leave town in order to save his life. I don't need to break this down so much. You'll hear it and you'll feel it the same way that I do once you hear the clip. But it's a nice sentimental piece. Again, it's not thematic. It's not something that we hear repeated over time and time again. It's just designed to tug at our heartstrings as Tyrion must say goodbye to Podrick. And in this case, you'll hear minor chords, once again, adding to our feelings of sadness, as opposed to major chords, which would make us feel happy. We also have the warm timbre, meaning the sounds of the instruments, that helps to tug at our heartstrings as well, specifically the strings. And this is really a lovely little piece, but I don't really feel it needs to be broken down or analyzed. I just want you to hear it and understand that it's, again, incidental music, not something that we hear on a regular basis. The trials in a fortnight will want an answer before that. I already gave them an answer, my lord. I will not have you die on your path. Do you hear me? That's really lovely. I mean, it, it does accompany this scene so very well. But finally, we get to the scene with Jamie and Cersei and the Sept. And believe me, I have plenty to say about this when we get to our story section. But I do feel like Ramin captures what was the true intention of the showrunners. Regardless of what they say, they wanted to create ambiguity and discomfort. And Ramin toggles between major chords and minor chords to create that ambiguity. You're going to hear them toggle mainly between the thirds of the chords, creating either major or minor. And that's what creates the ambiguity in the chords. Not only that, but a lot of low harmony, like we just talked about, which creates a lot of muddiness. We get everything very muddy. It's all this muddy mess of music that the discussion after this episode actually aired seemed to be. We were having a muddy discussion about this. Some people were saying, well, the showrunner said it was supposed to be consensual. Uh, and other people were saying, but yeah, but look at what actually happens. And I'm going to discuss all of that after you hear this clip. But I want you to really listen to the music and tell me what you make it makes you feel about the scene. And you'll see that that's what Ramin 
was feeling about the scene as he watched it. He felt just as conflicted to score it as we did to watch it. And we'll begin our discussion of Season 4, Episode 3, Breaker of Chains, written by the showrunners Benioff and Weiss and directed by Alex Graves after the clip. You're a hateful woman. Why have the gods made me love a hateful woman? So if you've been with the podcast for a while, you know how I break the story stuff down and we start with things that are on the surface. And I'm sorry if this is not the kind of talk you want to hear, but you're going to hear it or you can turn the podcast off. It's up to you. We have to talk about the Jamie and Cersei scene. I want to read you my transcription of the captions when I watch this on HBO Go. Not here, please. Please. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. Jamie, no. Cersei, stop it. Stop. Stop. It's not right. It's not right. Jamie, I don't care. I don't care. Cersei's crying. And then Jamie says one last time very strongly, I don't care. They even put reverb on it. Now, anyone who says that this is consensual is flat crazy. And you have Dave and Dan trotting everyone out there to explain the scene to the media because it got a big media buzz. They trot out the director. They trot out the actors. All to say that it was intended to resolve as consensual. And primarily, I imagine that's because they don't want to put a black stain on what we think is a, you know, reformed Jamie. But let's talk about the evidence. Not a theory or even me wearing my heart on the sleeve. In the scene, Cersei does grab Jamie's face. Not in a manner of self-defense. She's not pushing him away. She actually grabs his face. And that's when he's ripping her dress. Also, in the very next scene that these two appear together in in this series, while Cersei's not exactly warm to Jamie, she does not seem fearful. She does not seem angry. She does not seem intimidated. So, by evidence, it does seem to say that the writing did not address this as a rape, at least from this scene forward, because there's no evidence of Cersei ever accusing Jamie of anything or even acting like what happened was something bad. So, you do have that. And maybe it was the intention of Dave and Dan and the director and the actors to give off a sense of consensual sex. But I'm telling you, when you heard that dialogue and saw those captions, as I just related to you, I mean, you listen to the convoluted music that tells you that even Ramin Javadi was obviously very uncomfortable when he scored this and appropriately put this very muddled, muddy music underneath it. I mean, can you really do anything after that but remind yourself of the old axiom about good intentions and and what they pave? And here's the thing that really gets me. Even if Dave and Dan looked at this cut and then they regretted it or maybe they didn't have time to change it, they did let it stand and then turned around and said what they said or told other people to say what they said. Now, if they had done this to spark some kind of social discussion about the issues of rape, I would applaud them. But the only tangible result that I could find was that this scene 
got included in a heck of a lot more online and paper publications the next day, which unfortunately did not have the result of sparking serious discussions about the issue of rape. Instead, it just kind of got the Game of Thrones name out there even more, and even more people started watching it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everyone should have boycotted the show or that everybody should have suddenly brought out their peace pipes and started talking about rape. I'm not getting into boycotting or anything like that like I did after the Sansa scene the first time I saw it in season five. Because really, if it were the case, a lot of my critics made a very good case to me that if I was that bothered by the Sansa scene, then I should have been encouraging people to stop watching this show right after the very first episode during the Danny and Drogo wedding. And on a rewatch, woo, yeah, they're absolutely right. And mind you, I am not the moral police. All rape, be it Danny being raped, to the girls at Craster's later on this season, to Sansa, it's all horrific and evil. And I think we can all pretty much agree on that, right? But then we have HBO, which is kind of a grounds for allowing this kind of thing to be depicted without any real ramifications. Because this isn't television, this is HBO. And I don't even have a problem with that. If that's what you're into, then that's you, and I'm not going to judge you. The problem is, is that as we've gone on and on, it seems to me that people can't see the damages done to these female characters as a result of these horrific actions of these male characters, even from a story perspective. And I'm definitely going to say this. If you are not willing to even recognize rape when it happens right in front of you, either because a book written by George R. Martin told you it wasn't and you just went with that, or a TV show director came out the next day to help fuel up the media buzz and said, well, we intended for it to be consensual. I mean, if that's who you are, if you truly believe that, then kindly turn off this podcast and never come back. I'm not going to quit. You are. On the other hand, if you do really want to talk about this issue and give it its due diligence from a social aspect or in advocacy of all of those who have been raped, men and women, then I am definitely here for you. That is the end of my rant, I promise. But I just simply could not sit by and not say anything about something that is so prevalent in our society as an issue. Just in the last year, we finally had some abuse cases in Hollywood come up. And again, I like that I have this chance to actually talk about the issue of rape rather than having to talk about how Dave and Dan profited from it. But it, it's these are the kinds of things that we should take from our art and turn into the real issues. Not who beat who in a sword fight. Not Marjorie and Olena talking about who's going to be king now and will I be queen. And with that rant over, let's move on to some other things on the surface for me before we get into my three big things. Sansa's escaping was very exciting. And uh, as I already talked about in the music cue, I mean, I loved it. It was, it had a great amount of tension, the adding of the fog, which I, I guess for you people who count soldiers or whatever, why was there suddenly fog? I get it, you know, but I love the way that it created an ambience of mystery. You know, all of that just hit me really well. And then, of course, the reveal that it was Littlefinger. Now, mind you, when I watched season four, I had already read all of A Storm of Swords. So I knew it, that it was going to be Littlefinger somehow, one way or another, getting her away f from King's Landing. I didn't exactly know how, but I did know that that was going to be the case. So I didn't experience the surprise that some TV only people did for that particular scene, but I loved it on an emotional level, just the same. And of course, something else I always love on an emotional level, going from Sansa, who is one person who I will draw my line in the sand for, to Sam and Gilly, who are two other characters that I will always draw my line in the sand for. All of the Sam and Gilly scenes were so wonderful this time around, especially when they were working on the geese, on defeathering the geese. Uh, <laughs> they both so desperately want to tell each other that they like each other, but they just can't find a way. So it just becomes this awkward mess. 
is a, it, it's beautiful. I, I absolutely love that. And of course, I'm heartbroken by the fact that Sam feels like he can't protect Gilly at Castle Black. Unlike the way he could protect her from the White Walker, she thinks that he's some kind of big hero. I mean, he just got lucky. He just got, he was so desperate that it was the only thing he had left in his hand and he just went after it. He was willing to die. And that is admirable. That is very admirable, of course. But he was willing to die and he got lucky. He got lucky that that happened to be the one thing that could kill a White Walker. But it doesn't help Gilly in her case because she's now feeling like she's being abandoned again. I, I can only imagine that Molestown probably feels to Gilly not a whole lot unlike Craster's. She's already getting trouble because she can't keep her mouth shut about where she's from. But I mean, what is she supposed to say? She doesn't know any of these cities south of the wall. She's never been south of the wall. And so she just says, I'm from north of here. And of course, that girl comes right up with, oh, you're a wildling. Now, obviously, it doesn't come out to be that much trouble for Gilly because we're all re-watching this series. We're not watching it for the first time, at least I hope. If <laughs> if you are watching it for the first time, ooh, maybe go back and listen to the old podcast Winterfell reactions to this and then come back and, and listen to these after you've rewatched. Uh, the entire series. At any rate, um, the Sam and Gilly stuff was wonderful. Absolutely loved it. I also really loved the Oberyn Tywin meeting. That was awesome. It had great tension in it. And even to a non-book reader or a first-time watcher, it pointed to all kinds of possibilities. You know, you have Dorne's history of fighting the dragons mentioned. You have the possibility of Oberyn being on the small council. Now, none of that really comes to pass, right? We all know that. But I did love the showdown and the way that it proved that even Oberyn is not quite above playing the game of power, the game of thrones, by having the seat on the council. Pedro Pascal's reaction was brilliant as soon as uh, Charles Dance mentioned the small council. It was perfect. And I almost like to think since it doesn't really matter, I'll just fanfic this, but I, I, I like to think that Oberyn, the reason his eyebrow race wasn't for personal power himself, but how he could use that position to weed out the Lannisters from the inside. Of course, alas, none of it works out. And because Dorne really hates all of the Lannisters, and especially Cersei for doing what she does and what have you, uh, they end up siding with Danny, and that ends up pretty much costing all of the leadership of Dorne. I don't even know who's running the place down there now. I don't know if anybody's running the place down there right now. Maybe they're all just sitting around in a brothel, being together with boys and girls alike, the same way that Oberyn is. But either way, uh, it almost feels like Dorne is now completely out of the picture. Uh, and that's a shame, because it seems like this that gave Dorne so much potential when we were watching these things the first time around. Finally, and I mentioned this in the music stuff as well, the Tyrion and Podrick Payne scene, and that really got me this time around. Never been a more loyal squire. And Podrick, of course, has been that way to Tyrion, and it was very tearful and very hurtful to see them have to part ways. Um, but I love the fact that Podrick's still around being a, a more loyal squire now to Brienne in a lot of ways. I hope that someday Podrick does get his Sir Podrick Payne title as a knight. Um, if Danny ever sits the throne, I'm sure that Tyrion will make sure that that happens. Um, or if he stays in service of the North, maybe uh, Sansa or Jon Snow We'll make sure that that happens. Uh, there's bigger fish to fry, of course, right now than making Podrick Payne a knight. But I just kind of hope that for him because here he was offered it under some kind of guise of dishonesty and he refused it. And that's the perfect epitome, right? You have what a knighthood is supposed to be according to all of these people in Westeros the true shining example of loyalty and honesty and all of this stuff, all of the Arthurian legend kind of stuff. And because of that, 
Podrick refuses it because it's not gotten in the honest way. Love that. So that's my stuff for the surface. Let's move on to my three big things. Three, three big things. My first big thing is Arya and the Hound and Refuge. Because this, this is a big turning point for Arya and the Hound in a lot of ways. And it has huge implications, especially for the Hound in Season 7. Because Arya's condemnation of the Hound and what he does here at the end of the sequence... This is a huge thing, I feel like, that feeds the Hound's guilt when he returns to that place in Season 7. I don't know that he would have really felt that much about those people themselves if it hadn't been for the fact that Arya had condemned it so much. Remember, this is the girl who leaves him to die in pain. Won't give him the quick death like he asks for. The fact that she hated him so much at that point or maybe you can look at it of course from our audience perspective that Arya actually couldn't kill him she couldn't make herself do it but regardless the hound's perception is that Arya is simply punishing him and that punishment wakes him back up once again in season seven when he sees exactly what he had predicted to Arya here is that they wouldn't be able to survive. And couple that by the guilt of the fact that Arya said, you said you're not a thief, and yet, yeah, he did steal from these people. Is it the fact that he stole from these people the reason that they ended up dying? They'll be dead come winter, he says, regardless of how much silver they have. Dead men don't need silver. Did taking the silver cause them to be dead men? And that kind of cyclic recall was one of the best callbacks of season seven it was amazing and it was an amazing development for the hound because once again at his time of least amount of faith in himself and what have you that's when he sees something in the flames so this whole experience is huge for the hound and it's huge for aria too because when they're first talking about where they might go after aria is sent to the eerie or at least where the Hound might go. He says he might go to Bravos. Or Arya wants to go to Bravos, I guess. And she says that she has friends there. And the Hound says, I doubt it. Boy, couldn't that be more true? Obviously, the Faceless Men are not friends. Now, they help Arya achieve a skill to achieve her ultimate goal, which is all that Jock and Hagar really promised her back in Season 2. But it's just funny how the hound immediately says, I don't, I doubt it. And you look at that back on a rewatch and it's like, yeah, he was right. The other thing about Arya and Bravos in this particular scene, especially again, once in the opening sequence, this is the second time now that we've seen Arya already begin to learn how to play that famous game of faces that she plays in season five and season six of Game of Thrones. In the season three finale, she did so with the, I'm cold, I'm hungry, here's a coin thing, so that she could kill the soldier that had attached Grey Wind's head to Rob Stark's body. And then here, she does this whole little skit about the Hound being her father and correctly analyzing that uh, she should say the Tully of River Run in order to gain their trust, and they end up getting a free rabbit stew out of it. And uh, it, the surprise that she has when the Hound says fair wages for fair work, he agrees to it. She doesn't know what he's about to do. He's already planning it. That's obvious. But all of that was huge. This whole sequence was huge. The talk about guest rights once again. And now has the Hound violated guest rights? Because the guest rights go both ways. It's not just the person who is offering guest rights to you to come into their home. It's also you, once you accept those guest rights, to go into the house and look at what the hound did. Does that mean anything? Uh, I would say in the books, it might mean something more than it would in the television show. 
the television show loves to keep things clouded in mystery. And there's even talk of leeches in this particular episode, which we can maybe talk about in a little bit, but it's not part of one of my three big things. My point being is that uh, the God's actual active role in these people's lives is perceived to be a lot more powerful than perhaps the magic that is actually real is, if that makes any sense to you. Now, my second big thing is Daenerys reaching Marine, and mainly because this is the place that we've actually seen her stay longest on the show. She gets here now. She'll be there for the rest of season four. She'll be there for all of season five. And uh, even though she gets away at the end of season five and, and has to spend some time in Vase Dothrak in season six, she returns there in season six before she takes off for Westeros. So it was one season with Khal Drogo, another season in Karth. Uh, the third season was about Slaver's Bay. You had the Astapor and the Yuk Yunkai thing. But now she finally finds a home. And that's where she stays for a while. She decides that this is where I will learn how to rule, not just conquer. But man, speaking of conquering, what swagger Daenerys has. Even that opening shot when she's riding the horse and all of her troops are marching in. I mean, she just looks like a total kick butt person, right? I, I just loved it. There was so much swagger there. And the speech to the people of Marine was one of her best speeches ever. It was fierce and it had a weight to it. And I, I loved that speech. It's like, yes, this is who Danny is. She is a savior and she definitely has that savior complex. That's for sure. And we'll see, of course, see how that. Um, sometimes gets in the way of practical ruling, even in the very next episode. But I, I did love all of those sequences with Danny in this particular scene. And then when you have in the middle air where the, the challenger comes out and is doing all of the nasty things, saying all the terrible things, and they're trying to decide who's going to be Danny's champion. Here's a nice moment for, for Danny and Jorah and not in the pervert Jorah way, but in the Jorah friend zone way, once again, sealing the fate for Jorah the friend zone. She says, you're my most trusted advisor, my most valuable general, and my dearest friend. I will not gamble your life. And I just like, oh, Danny really does care about him until she finds out that he's been betraying her. Well, he hasn't been betraying her for a long time, but he started out by betraying her. And there you have it. That's one of those things that uh, destroys my dearest friend. And I will not gamble with your life. She could care less by the time all of that is revealed. And what the end of this season actually is when that happens. And finally, of course, paving the way for the Dario and Danny relationship. Dario gets to show off and it's clear that he's winning her interest. Now, I think... Of course, looking at the end of season six, when she has that conversation with Tyrion, that we can determine that Danny never really did ever love Dario, but she was awfully interested in him. And, you know, Girl Scout needs, I guess. So this is another way for Dario to ruffle his feathers, to show his colors, to... Uh, do whatever it is that males do to get the attention of females. And my third big thing, which may not seem like a big thing to you, but it, to me it is, it's the introduction of Ollie in the North. To me, this is a big thing because Ollie has a significant role in both, of course, Ygritte's death and in John's death. To me, he's kind of like a young Anakin Skywalker. He's like this gifted student who eventually turns to evil due to the loss of his mother. He has this real hatred, and it's stemming from fear from this very first scene. And he ends up doing his duty as a member of the Night's Watch, I suppose. And he was following Alistair Thorne's 
orders. He didn't question them. He didn't have any problem putting an arrow in Egrit. And I watched this scene this time with great interest because I wanted to see if Ollie had actually seen Egrit or recognized her. And yeah, it's right there. So you totally understand why at the end of this season, he has no problem putting an arrow through Egret, even if she and John are either about to make up or she's about to kill him. Ollie has been about revenge uh, from this moment onward, really. But uh, he would seem like he was a pretty good kid up until this traumatic event. Um, you, do we make a comparison with Arya? Was she a pretty good kid? Up until they killed her dad and up until they took all of her friends away and up until they killed her brother and her mother. I don't know. Is Arya still a good person now? I don't know. Is Ollie still a good person now? No, Ollie's dead. But it still felt just a little bit heartbreaking when John had to hang Ollie. So those are my three big things. I do have a question for this particular episode. Questions. questions. And that question turns to the Davos and Stannis side of the story. We get the second leech drop, and don't worry, the question is not about the second leech. But Stannis is growing incredibly impatient with Davos. Davos can't put an army together, seemingly, for him. And Stannis says this. If I do not press my claim, my claim will be forgotten. I will not become a page in someone else's history book. Now, back in season two, when Stannis was trying to take the Iron Throne and the Battle of Blackwater happened, he seemed to be all about what was right. Yet he was already doing some not necessarily right things with Melisandre and her magic in terms of like Renly and what have you. And he went and lost the Battle of Blackwater. He did not have the Red Woman. And he's always kind of blamed Davos for make, convincing him not to have the Red Woman with him. But now that he's been sitting, brooding on Dragonstone for a while, and he's all upset because Davos let Gendry go once again, because evidently the leeches are working, at least as far as Stannis is concerned. But he says this whole thing about, if I do not press my claim, my claim will be forgotten. Is this the key to Stannis becoming more and more radical in terms of what he is willing to do? Is it the fact that the leeches are working that convinces him that it's okay to burn his own daughter? What do you think about that? Is, is it his impatience and the fact that he feels the leeches are working that is really the linchpin for him being able to even kill his own daughter? And that doesn't make it right, obviously. It's horrific. It's murder. And it's awful. But can we, on a rewatch, start to see more and more and more of Stannis' decline from season two through his end to season five? Is, is it more apparent at, about how more desperate he's becoming? And is a thought like this just as much of part as the whole Gendry leeches thing working that causes Stannis to become the most horrific of parents. So ponder on that question and we'll get to my tidbits. Tid tidbits. And these are just other small little points that we'll figure into future episodes. And I'm going to stay right here with the Davos and Stannis conversation. Davos mentions the golden company here and Stannis says, well, he doesn't like sellswords. And it's not clear to me that the Golden Company was the sellsword company that Davos hired, but Stannis certainly has a pretty big army when he goes up north of the Wall at the end of this season. So whatever sellsword company that they did end up hiring for the end of this season, that company does end up abandoning Stannis at Winterfell because of what he does to his daughter, more or less. Again, we can't say it's the Golden Company that he hired. I don't even remember if the name of whatever sellsword company that Stannis hired is mentioned or that Davos hired is mentioned. But Stannis, in a way, is correct. They end up betraying him and it ends up causing his death. Although, 
if I was a sellsword guy, I wouldn't want to work for Stannis either. I'd be make getting the heck out of there in the course of the night myself. But here's the linchpin. And that is that Cersei also intends to hire the Golden Company for her army. She talks about that. She's even sending uh, Euron Greyjoy to Essos to go get them. So, is Cersei's fate possibly sealed by the fact that she is going to trust a sellsword co company? As far as we can tell, Dario's second sons are the only ones who have actually been loyal to anybody. And that was to Danny, And she, I don't even know if she's actually... I don't think she's actually even using them now. She has her Dothraki. She has her Unsullied. I don't... I guess she probably left the Second Sons back in Essos to look after the lands on Slaver's Bay under the leadership of Dario. Is that what has happened? And will this end up biting Cersei in the butt the same way that a sellsword company ended up biting Stannis in the butt. Davos also mentions the Iron Bank. That comes into play again. Uh, and Davos has Shireen write a letter. Well, in just a couple episodes, we're going to have Davos and Stannis going to the Iron Bank, trying to get some of that money so that they can hire a sellsword company. And we've seen where all of the Iron Bank stuff ends up. There was a mention in the last episode, The Lion and the Rose, where Olena Tyrell tells Tywin Lannister that she has a feeling that Tywin will be asking for her help in regards to the Iron Bank. Well, Olena does actually end up helping with the Iron Bank, just not in the way that she thought. Her death and the looting of Highgarden is what ends up paying the Iron Bank back. And then Cersei turns right around and borrows against it again. <laughs> And uh, to get her own sellsword company. So all of that stuff is stuff that's still going to be coming into play. All of the little mentions that we see in this episode uh, will play a huge role and may yet still play a huge role in season eight. As far as North at the Wall, we talked about Sam and Gilly, but the other part we didn't talk about was Grin and Ed getting back. And of course, this sets up the whole Craster's Keep showdown here in a couple of episodes, which we'll be covering. John has this whole thing about how we can't go help anybody down south of the wall, but we have to go north of the wall because it might militarily give John's lies away. Seems to me, though, at the end of this season, in the finale, Mance pretty much has already figured out it didn't he didn't need that information. He had set up everything to be able to figure out that information for himself all in one night. And then he was already starting actions uh, to get around this small band that John had lied about. So uh, is it an exercise in futility? I, I guess you can look at that. I, I know that critics like to say, well, this story didn't mean anything. It didn't go anywhere. On the other hand, there's lots of things in life that end up not really meaning anything. It's actually a very fairly realistic concept that we do all these things. We make these plans and then none of it works out or it wasn't necessary. So I don't ever mind that aspect of it. I mean, yeah, I like to be entertained by my stories. I like for everything to mean something. But not everything in the world means something. So I kind of appreciate that. One other just little tidbit from North there is when Pip says, I don't think I can kill a 100 wildlings. And nope, he doesn't make it that far to kill a 100 wildlings, unfortunately. And that's all I have to say about this particular episode. So let's move on to our last two segments. They're little participation segments that you can participate in too by sending emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com, M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com, or you can tweet to Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter while these episodes are still airing, and we'll be sure to include them in the next feedback podcast, which will follow the season finale of this season. But the first of those two segments is three words. That's next. Three words. Describing the episode in three words. 
trying to describe the episode in three words. Thank you, Mr. Foley. That's Axel Foley from the DVR Podcast Network. He actually took over Podcast Winterfell for me, uh, him and his network, when I was unable to continue with it due to touring. And uh, he's always had an open invitation for me to come back. I really appreciate that. At any rate, uh, be sure to check out Podcast Winterfell. You can follow him at Winterfell Pod. Uh, also, my friends Bubba and Kelly, feel free to follow them on Twitter. They were on an episode. And Stephanie, she would have been on an episode by now as well. You can find Bubba at Fit and Trim on Twitter. It's F I T T E N T R I M. Have to spell it because he always does. Or the double P, is it, is it DP Media or double P Media? Oh, I'm going to get that wrong. Um, anyway, just follow Bubba. He's retweeting stuff from the Double P Media Network. And that way you'll be able to figure out who to follow. You can follow Kelly at Kelly Underfoot on Twitter. And you can follow Stephanie at SM Persephone. That's S-M-P-E-R-S-E phone on Twitter. What, what am I doing just riddling off Twitter names? Oh, because you can tweet your three-word description of this episode to me if you wish. How about that? How about that for a segue? We're trying to describe this episode in three words, and it doesn't always have to be about the episode as a whole. I generally try to do that. I did not try to do that this time around. Uh, Instead, I went with something very specific, something that melted my heart, and that was the Tyrion and Podrick Payne goodbye. Uh, I just was destroyed by that this time emotionally. And so my three words are Sir Podrick Payne. And it really has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? I really want Podrick to become a knight before, you know, a White Walker sticks something through him. I have to hope that that actually happens. Podrick is one of the most loyal people ever. So uh, that's, again, one of my favorite scenes of the episode. By the way, folks, if you're listening to this podcast on a regular podcast app, you're hearing music underneath here. Just go look at the show notes and see who's producing that music. I'm not asking that you buy any of their stuff. I'm not sponsored. I don't ask for money for anything. I'm just saying that for musicians, it's really important for people just to know who you are, even if you don't buy their stuff. That's how we become immortal. So look in the show notes for who helped produce the theme music for this podcast, who helped produce some of the music that goes underneath some of the segments of this podcast. You will have done me a solid. More importantly, you will have done that musician a solid. That's all I have to say for three words. Let's move on to the final segment for this episode. That is the brothel mates of the episode. That is the best coupling. That's next. Brothel mates of the episode. The best coupling of the episode. Brothel mates of the episode. The best coupling of the episode does not have to be two people. Naturally, it could be a person and a concept, a person and an emotion, a person and anything person and an object, I guess, if you wished. Uh, Mine are two people this time around. And, oh, big surprise, my best coupling of the week is Podrick and Tyrion. Again, this scene just totally destroyed me. You know, I I get angry about things like the Cersei-Jamie scene and not because I'm grading rape. I'm not. I don't think that any rape is less severe than another and people will say well why didn't you react to the danny rape the same way that you're reacting to the cersei rape why didn't you react to the craster rape the same way that you reacted to all of this others and the truth is is that i'm not reacting any differently i hate it all but in the case of danny or in the case of craster's women in a couple of episodes from here it's very easy to see that it is rape here we had to get it muddled up It wasn't me who was grading rape. It was Dave and Dan who were grading rape. And if you want to slurp up the piss that they trotted out there, then feel free. But I'm telling you, man, that's a problem. That's a problem when you try to define something as something that's not. Intentions be damned. It's probably the strongest language I've ever used on this podcast. And I promised that I wasn't going to talk about that end again, but I just, I got to thinking about brothels and couplings and, and there you go. Anyway, my coupling this week is Podrick and Tyrion. Oh, they were the perfect pair, were they not? 
and they are the perfect pair no more, unfortunately. But uh, what a run for these guys. And uh, they had some great moments. They were a lot of fun together. And uh, I'm trying to recall if in Season 7 they saw each other at all because everybody started coming back together then. I'm going to have to revisit that uh, at a later date because I can't remember. Or if you remember, then you can tweet to Matt's GOT blog, M-A-T-T-S G-O-T blog on Twitter. Or you can send an email to Matt's audio blog at gmail.com. Again, M-A-T-T-S audio blog at gmail.com. And tell me whether Podrick and Tyrion saw each other again, because I honestly can't remember. I would think that if they had, I would remember it. But then again, my brain is full of medical terminology and anatomy and physiology and trying to do public speaking and all of this other stuff. So probably not going to be able to access that right out of the corner of my brain unless I rewatch the episodes, which won't be for a little while because we still have several seasons to go through. I have rambled enough. Thanks for going on this ride today with me. We will have Bubba and Kelly returning for the next episode to talk about Game of Thrones. And then, let's see, episode five will be me. Episode six will be our friend Susan. Uh, Actually, episode six and seven. And then we'll have Stephanie back for episode eight. We'll have Holly and Kelly for episode nine. And finally, Susan, once again, for episode 10. Hope you're going to enjoy all of the guests that we have. They all have much better thoughts about this show than I do. Uh, I'm typically just the guy that asks the right questions, and then I get, hopefully, the better answers from them. Do you have any thoughts? Again, mattsaudioblog at gmail.com or mattsgotblog on Twitter. You can always go to mattsaudioblog.com to find all of the information regarding this podcast. See you next time.